Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, this is uh, this living room here when we set it up as an auditorium is called the King Kigali Auditorium because King Kigali, King of Rwanda, who you can see in the in that photo over there, uh, for for many years was a uh, was an honored guest here at our meetings, etc. He 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 passed away few years ago. But so welcome to the King Kigali Auditorium. And uh, it's a special pleasure to have the priests, uh, Father Anderson, Father Kusik, and Father Nichols. Um, and uh, it, is the, it is our honor to, um, to have Sister Didi here. My colleague Preston O will introduce her. I just wanted to, uh, to uh, say a few words of, of welcome. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Mario, the director of the Washington Bureau uh, for 41 years now. And uh, lately, because of the, the situation in my country, in Brazil, I have had to, um, uh, to travel more between here and there, etc. I'm spending most of my time there where I am president of the Plinio Correa de Oliveira Institute, the institute uh, that has the name of our founder, founder of uh, tradition farming property. So uh, so now I ask Preston to, to introduce our dear guest. So, Sister Deirdre Byrne, but she likes to be called Sister Dee Dee. I, I, how do I know that? Because she picks up with Sister Dee Dee. <laughs> so at least I, you know, I didn't ask her, but I noticed Sister Dee Dee more than once. Uh, so Sister Sister Dee Dee Byrne is. Uh, do you probably know who she is? Does she need an introduction? She, uh, it's probably good to give a little bit of an introduction. She's she is the superior of the Washington D.C. convent of the. Uh, Piccole, uh, and I forgot how to say it, Piccole, uh, the, the, the little workers of the Sacred Heart. But she's also, as her brother, Bishop William Byrne of Springfield, uh, Massachusetts says, she's one of the three S's. Sister, soldier, and surgeon. <laughs> and she's a real surgeon. Because I've been over at the convent when she had to go and perform some surgery. So uh, she, she is a stalwart in the pro-life arena, and especially now in opposing euthanasia. She has a real story to tell. I'm not going to tell it. If she wishes to fill you in, which she probably will, you'll get a real earful. So with that, thank you, Sister Thank you, Do I get to sit here? Do I sit here? What do I do? How do you like? I don't know if you needed the mic. <laughs> Whatever you like. Does this work? Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Well, thank you, Preston, for for the intro. I'll just sit so that. And if you all want to have a second drink, if the talk gets a little bit slow, since I've been, <laughs> since a few you know my brother, and he said get your pillow, and I have five brothers. I have five brothers, so you're not. I he always maintain humility around the boys, so. I'd like to first start with a, a prayer, and one of my favorite from Blessed Mary of Jesus Crucified. She was um, a Carmelite nun. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Holy Spirit, inspire me. Love of God, consume me. To the true path, lead me. Mary, my mother, look down upon me. With Jesus, bless me. From all evil, from all illusions, from all danger, preserve me. Amen. So, again, thank you, Preston, for the invite. And I met Preston in, in um, Illinois. I, I met him somewhere. Oh, yes, out in Chicago. No, here. We met here. Oh, Catching okay. a plane to Chicago. Actually, we met at the airport in at Chicago. Airport. So, anyhow, um, he was... Too. Okay. So, he... But, but basically, I was w wandering through the airport, and he said, I think we're going to the same place. So, he helped me get to where I had to go. And so I call him my guardian angel because he, he was there at, when I, at a time when I really needed And that's how the Holy Spirit works, anyhow. So thank you all for coming on this eve of when 50 years ago we had this horrible law 
Roe v. Wade, that which ripped the lives of over 50 million souls and wounded 100 plus more, 100 million others, moms and dads who made deadly choices. Am I not making, am I not loud enough? Testing? It's not working. Do you hear me in the back? Preston, you want to give my talk because your voice is loud. <laughs> it's not the same. Testing. Yeah. Testing. Okay. So, anyhow, with Roe v. Wade, 50 years ago, uh, you can hear me now, there's um, been you know, millions of souls lost and twice as many because there's a mother and a father that's involved. Sometimes we forget about the dad. And they made deadly choices, literally deadly choices. And although we must be thankful for the decision of Dobbs versus Jackson that brought the end to Roe v. Wade, we, the fight to save all lives is not over, but rather it's, we have a new chapter. It's at the state level. It is still a battle to change hearts, one soul at a time. So to pray away the satanic infestation that has permeated the world. Many, many heroes came far and wide to prayerfully protest yesterday, and we will never stop protesting till every life is considered valuable, both our babies in the womb and our vulnerable who are being euthanized, and I'll share a little bit later. I hope you don't mind, but I'd like to share a little bit about two heroes in my own life, my mother and father. As a family, we were blessed to have parents in which their faith was the center in their of their relationship, and they were both daily communicants. They taught me of the sacredness of the Holy Eucharist, and not by their words, but by their actions. So it was a natural fit when I entered this community, the Piccolo Aparai de Sacred Heart. There we go. <laughs> the little workers of the Sacred Hearts 20 plus years ago, where our founder, who's now beatified, Blessed Monsignor Francesco Greco, Italiano, uh, said, it was before the most blessed sacrament that I found the love of Jesus and the power of that love. So my parents were living witnesses of their own faith and their love of family. And it, so this faith nurtured my own vocation as well as my other siblings. I'm one of eight. Uh, my, my, most of them are married. My youngest brother is Preston mentioned, um, I think, or Mario said, that he's now a bishop in Springfield, Massachusetts. And in this day and age, it's not easy to be a bishop. So it's um, so keep him in your prayers. So my parents are really are parents. They are the best catechist, all parents are, to bring the faith into which the family, and which is why it's so critical that we have to, to defend the faith, the family, to pre protect them at every stage of their life, medically and spiritually, from the womb to the tomb. So as I said, mom raised eight of us kids, and dad was a thoracic surgeon over at Fairfax Hospital. So we, I grew up in McLean on the other side, um, St. Luke's Parish. And uh, dad w w loved his work, went to the hospital every day, and he, he would have been a good TFPer because he always wore his coat and tie no matter where, even if it was three in the morning going to the emergency room. <laughs> But with all that, they both found it possible to go to daily Mass. So the Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist, is the source and summit of our Catholic faith. And even so, even on vacations, maybe some of your parents did the same, but Dad would scout out the, as soon as we landed where we were, he'd find out where the, the nearest parish was for the next day's Mass. And so we could go to Mass before the day began. And just a little medical tidbit that all the cheese and the crackers and the wine, everything that you've consumed, will be with you for a good three plus hours. <laughs> so when you think about that, when you consume the Holy Eucharist, you're, that's with us for a good three hours. So mom and dad, after they came, went to Mass, mom usually came home, dad may have gone to the hospital, um, or sometimes he'd come home again and then go on out, that they were walking tabernacles, just like our Blessed Mother. You know, she was with her fiat, she carried our Lord, and we are in a, in a very profound way that our Lord allowed us to be able to carry Him. And so you really have to realize, and I'll say this to the younger folks, that miracles will occur during that period of time. It's a very powerful three hours. So expect it, expect, expect it and hope for it. Because if we're open to God's grace in, in our own lives, um, we have to also, there's a caveat to that, we have to also be in the state of grace. I want to talk about that mainly for today. 
Now, I was born with a congenital dislocated hip, which means the hip was out of the socket. So for a good year and a half, I had to uh, wear a body cast. I was like, like, had to plug their nose my they're around me. And my older siblings would drag me along the floor and use me as a step stool so they could reach up high. And grab me. <laughs> but I learned in, the early, in those early days that being stepped on isn't bad, really. It's a way to really lift people up. It's, it's, a, it's the half cup is full all the time. Now, believe it or not, you guys back there, we grew up in a very carefree time with no cell phones, no electronics. I don't think we even had, we had a black and white TV in those days, I think. But we lived half our, as a result, we lived half our lives outdoors. I mean, I could climb trees. Um, five brothers, they taught me how to play football pretty well, spiral football throw and everything. We um, went down to the creek, grabbed, found frogs, and turned, they turned into tad tadpoles into frogs, and um, played ring and run. Had to go to confession for some of the things we did with that game. <laughs> we we um, spent our days looking for money in Dad's, you know, car or when he lay down on the couch and the money would trickle down. <laughs> so I really didn't know if they were really raising mercenaries or missionaries. But <laughs> and I know that you would all agree that God shows us, uh, you know, so much in our life through little lights, little things. So I just want to share a little bit of some of the lights that, that God put in my own life. And I know you all could sit here and share even more profound stories. But these were lights that allowed me to realize in my years that God was really re re there for me. He was real. So when I went to med school, after med school, I had gone on an Army scholarship, PUA, and um, your Navy, I know, Father. Uh, Cardinal, I mean, Bishop um, Coffey yesterday actually gave a hua to the Army folks, right, Jason? He's a Navy boy, Bishop Coffey, but he, he has to be ecumenical now, he said. <laughs> I served, in those early years, I was a family doctor, and uh, my first assignment was the Sinai Peninsula. I got Egyptian friends here now. And so I got to be, I was very blessed. Um, I, I volunteered for the assignment to really go to the desert to pray. Now, I was the only female officer in a camp of about a thousand men, so I, uh, even if you were a US zero, you'd become a Sinai seven real fast, I used to say. But I became very close to them, believe it or not, now that I know a little bit of the relationship between the Greek, the Orthodox Christians and and the Catholics, but I became very close to the monks there at St. Catherine. And this monastery is a fourth century monastery in the, in the base of the hills of Mount Sinai and, the, and St. Catherine, where St. Catherine, her body was um, brought over by angels and she was um, cut in many pieces. The story of St. Catherine is beautiful. And I would do monthly sick call for the, for the Bedouins and for the monks there. Um, so they really opened their hearts to me and allowed me to be a pilgrim rather than just a, a tourist. Um, later on, I was stationed in Korea, um, and I witnessed my first miracle there, and, and the, the sister who became a very dear friend of mine taught me a lot about faith because she did international retreat work, um, was the one that was euthanized later. But she gave me holy water, and she said, Didi, remember, you are Jesus' doctor, so you need to bless all your patients with this Lord's water from Lord's. And I took it a step extra, so I would ask the priest doing hospital ministry to also bless the IV fluids so that the patients would get infused holy water. I was asked to medevac this patient who had been on a coma for um, for about a month. She was a, a dependent wife. I mean, she was a mother of a, of a dependent wife, so she didn't have any military um, connections, so the family was accruing a big bill. She was on a breathing machine called a ventilator for a good month, in a coma, not moving. So, they, so I was blessed to medevac her back to the U.S. It was a three-day journey. And so we, we prayed over her. Her daughter was Catholic, so we anointed her and prayed. And quite honestly, I have to be honest, I did not pray for a miracle. I just prayed that I wouldn't kill her if the tube popped out in the middle of the air and I'd have to try to re-intubate her. But somewhere in the middle, she started to meet in the, in the, sky, in the heavens. She started moving her fingers and her eyes or opening and her leg. 
And by the time we got to California where we had to put her into the ICU before headed on, heading on for further medevac stops, she was totally awake. We had to, you know, tie her down. And so I was um, stunned by this and realized that God really has a, had a mission for me. Another just little quickie, um, my final hurrah in the Army was in 2008 when a certain person was going to become president, it was easier to resign my commission, to know, to retire in a sense. But I was stationed in Afghanistan, and these mil military people are just fantastic, um, especially when you're in harm's way, like they were, the way they would um, um, really be focused on their prayer life. So there were five of us that would meet in the chapel. It was a military classic chapel, so we had no blessed sacrament. But when we had five priests all in all of Afghanistan, so this priest was always flying here, there, and everywhere, and in harm's way. And so he would not always make it for Mass. So we would make a, 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 a promise that we would try our hardest to meet and pray every day. We would do the readings, the rosary, we'd pray all the sacramentals as much as we could as, as non-priests. Um, and hope Father could show up, which many a times he didn't. So it was really, for me, a desert of not receiving our Lord in a real sense. But by the end of our three months there, we had over 100 people showing up praying with us every day. And um, just a beautiful thing, we even had a few that were not even Christian that wanted to become Catholics because of they saw our love for our Lord. And it just shows to, it was a reaffirm, affirmation to me that we're all meant for love. And the most ultimate of these loves is our Lord. And, and so, so that's why people who are so thirsty for the love of God, we may be their only fifth, fifth gospel. And I'm going to, I don't know if I'll embarrass Jason, because I don't think he gets embarrassed, but I'll just really quickly tell a story. Jason Jones, Jason, can you raise your hand? He's here with his son. And um, <laughs> Jason is the president of Vulnerable People's Project, and last year I received a phone call of a doctor that I sta was stationed with. Um, I didn't really remember her until she, her son sent me photos, but she was captured by the Taliban and was under a lot of stress. And all this was happening after a certain president had, you know, pulled us out mm -hmm. and of our support there. And I was, the son said, please help us. You're our only hope. And I said, how, did, first of all, how did you get my number? And I mean, I was like, well, all these things were flying through my head. So the next morning, I met with friends, of, mutual friends of Jason, who then said, oh, you've got to talk to Jason Jones. And so we had a Zoom talk that day, that Sunday. I'll never forget it. And in about three weeks, Jason had 13, well, he sent food, coal, food, and got um, housing for them. And then a, in, in a week later, 13 family members in safe haven in what they call a lily pad. And, um, I mean, this guy is a mover and a shaker, so, and Jason has promised to help do a movie on Sister Phil Marie because she was you, my dear friend who gave me the Lord's water and everything, and I have two friends here who are very close to Sister Phil Marie that came with me today because they were here for the march, who uh, witnessed, we witnessed the death of Sister withdrawing food uh, feeding and oxygen, and it took her four, later, four days to die. And we have a lot of video footage to show that she was fully awake and alert. So thank you, Jason, for help saving this family, and he has saved thousands of others. He's helped in Ukraine and China, and, and I know I'm not giving enough credit for all the other things you do, but if you look up Vulnerable People's Project, um, you'll see all the great work that Jason does. When I was a missionary in 89, I met my high school hero, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Uh, I had read everything about her life, and I had, as a young, um, say in 89, I think I was just out of my, um, just beginning my, almost ending my military career. Well, I thought I was ending my military career, but um, I had made a promise that I would do free loving 
care, medical care for the poor, which I have done, that's what I do right now, that I wouldn't receive any money from, from any of my patients. And so she was a great inspiration to me. In 96, I was gone back to, to Georgetown to Hoyleville and finished my surgical residency there. But during that time of my surgical training, I had two uh, patients that were very, uh, very special to me. One was His Eminence Cardinal Hickey, and I, I happened to be on the cardiac surgery service as a chief resident at that time. He came in with crushing chest pain from Lourdes. And so it, nothing is by mistake, but I got to be his, uh, the first assistant in his open heart surgery. You know, so we you know, crack open the chest and harvest the vein and we help do the surgery. And then we, as chiefs, we manage him post-operatively. So I had his essence, I had his eminence's heart in my hand for a short while. And we became very close. And so he ended up becoming my spiritual guide, my friend. And he was so wonderful, Cardinal Hickey, that when I went out to California to work in a, in a practice there for a little while, he would write letters, send books, spiritual books and everything. And I'm just a nobody. And he had a whole diocese to care for, but he was so gracious that way. Real, he was a real father. As a, and that's what I think our bishops have to be, is fathers. Father fathers. <laughs> Um, and the other patient was, again, Mother Teresa had come in 97 to receive the Congressional Award. So the, the Missionaries of Charity, as a, as a gift for me, got, I was able to be with her 24-7, and so she blessed me at night. So I, I, was with, I was witnessing the life of a beautiful saint that I was praying that I could just do, take one ounce of her, her um, holiness. And my last, when I was with her on this Learjet that's this very wealthy local Catholic had had her fly around the United States in, I, I got to sit with her and, and her words to me were, keep your eyes on the cross. So I share that with everyone that, that that's really, right now we're on this way of the cross, this Via Dolorosa, and the world has gotten really crazy. Cra every day we wake up we hear another crazy story that we have to, you know, we can't waver, we can't fear, we can't be worried. We'll just keep our eyes on the cross because that's where our, our sanctity will come from. And I'll do the, the last little thing was that in 2020 when I saw the writing on the wall that if, if um, this present president became president that our pro-life efforts were going to go southward. So I was in the chapel praying fervently, our little chapel in D.C., and I just said, Lord, you know, I'm not doing enough for you, and I'm really sorry. But if you want me to, I will be your voice for life. I'm your girl. <laughs> I kind of said it like that. Nobody was around, so they wouldn't. And uh, about two hours later, the White House called, the Trump White House called, and asked would I be willing to speak at the Republican National Convention. And I said, um, can I speak? Oh, first of all, I was a little bit taken back by it. And I said, can I speak on the sanctity of life? And they said, you absolutely can. Now, I didn't, we're a traditional community, and I should have, you know, shot it up to Mother General. But I thought, in Rome, but I thought that had already kind of superseded. It's like going from the colonel to the general, our Lord. And then one of our sisters, who's our provincial, said, you know, I said, I'm being invited to the White House to give a RNC, or to give a talk. And she said, well, don't tell Mother General. We'll wait. She won't know anything about it. And I said, I think... I think we better tell her. <laughs> and she said, "Okay." So I told her. I said, "I'm speaking at the at on the sanctity of life." And she went, "Bravo, bravo!" <laughs> until until she found it out found out that it was at a Republican convention. And she said, "We don't do, you know, political things." And I said, "It's not political. It's it's moral and it's um, theological and all the things you can think of that it is that the sanctity of life is not a political issue." And so, um, but people, the devil will try to rear that ugly head. And so that's why with this now I've been invited to speak and I'm not the best speaker. The best, one of the great ones is my brother up in Massachusetts. But anyhow, here I am joyfully with you all speaking on, on things that are very important to me. But with all these good things that the Lord said, you know, this is, yes, you're my, you're, you're for me, I, you belong to me. Um, I love you more than anything, as he says to each one of us. He then allowed me, as a general surgeon, to view some of man's inhumanity to man. 
So in September 10th, 2001, I was up in Manhattan with Sister Priscilla, Mother Teresa's Secretary General, and that next morning, September 11th, I was with one of the sisters who was getting health care. Now I had one foot in the medical door, I mean one foot in the military door, and one in the religious door. I just met the little workers, the piccolo operari de Sacro Cori. So I was in the process of entering with them um, when the two towers fell. And so by that evening, I was at the base of the towers giving food and water to the firefighters. It was an amazing experience, but the Lord allowed me to see man's inhumanity to man at a level that is beyond comprehension. And I know each one of us can remember that day where what we were doing where we were. When I was a missionary in 2014, I went to Iraq a couple times, went to serve the, the refugees in the camps, mostly Muslim displaced, but we had several Christians. Bless you. And there was one man who came up to me. We were, you know, these, these refugees, Archbishop Warda, that guy's doing such great work. They had many sheltered open homes, uh, open hotels, and he just took all these refugees that were displaced. Lots of Christians and um, many non, non uh, Muslims. And one man, and they looked horrible. Now, uh, these guys looked like refugees. They didn't look like some of the people that I've taken care of on Route, on route 50 in the hotels that have these TV sets that are, uh, but that's another story. Anyhow, <laughs> they looked horrible. But one man came up to me and he said, they've, they've taken my home, they've killed some of my family, but they cannot take my God away from me with tears in his eyes. So we, our strong Christian Chaldeans give us a powerful example of courage. Knowing God's love and mercy will prevail. And I also did a mission, I missioned a lot in Sudan, covered with an American missionary. I like these places that where the bullets are flying in, in one direction. So, But anyhow, Sudan was in a very uh, rough area mid in the Nuba Mountains. And many of the, the North Sudanese would drop shrap metal bombs that would explode a foot above the ground so that they would slice anything in its way. And so it was, it was medically and surgically in an a very gr good place to be, but it was really sad to see, again, man's inhumanity to men. And we cannot forget our elderly murdered by euthanasia. And I, as I said, I lost Sister Philip Marie Burley. We have some prayer cards. I wrote a prayer on euthanasia. And we need to do more about fighting that other end of the pro-life issue because the more I share the story, the more people are telling me their story. The, but equally as evil is what we have here in our front yard, and that is not this neighborhood, but we have the battleground of Planned Parenthood with the destruction of life our most innocent, our own children, at any stage of development. We're doing, in D.C., we have the third trimester abortionists. They pay $20,000. They fly people in. They actually have fundraisers so that you can help people get their third trimester abortion. Um, and although we're grateful, we are grateful for the decision of Dobbs versus Jackson that brought an end to Roe v. Wade almost 50 years ago, this decision did not make abortion illegal but just put the legal determination in the hands of the states. So like I said, we have a lot of work to do to defend life. Because we currently have the most pro-abortion president in our history. And he also boasted being a Catholic. This, he is party, in, in general, as Father Ed Meeks, I highly recommend he's a uh, priest up in Towson who's a beautiful soul. He put it so beautifully last October 1st, Pro-Life Sunday, he said this, They and their party have declared war on the unborn, and for those who speak or defend the life of the unborn and their mothers. They, the left, are working endlessly to make abortion accessible all the way to the end of the third trimester. What is their motivation? Father Meek says, it is a demonically inspired obsession that sees abortion not only as a necessary evil, but really something desirable, almost a demonic sacrament from the left, which after ending Roe v. Wade has led to the vandalism of pregnancy centers throughout the United States, even targeting pro-lifers with early morning raids in their homes by the FBI agents. Since when has the FBI 
and the local pl um, police force began been there, the Planned Parenthood police force. And even though Roe v. Wade has been overturned, our work is far from over. In so many ways, we are in a very difficult times with health care, including this most recent administration ruling to allow most pharmaceutical corporations to take on this abortion pill that kills a baby, and even when a mother receives a prescription on telemedicine. Now, let me just tell you, you have to, this pill can only be given in the first trimester. I don't know how you can t tell that via telemedicine. This is, this is not only dangerous, this is malpractice. In Ephesians 6.12, it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So this battle we face right now is not between Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, or liberals, the right or the left. No. This battle is against our dear Lord and the evil one, the devil. I called it COVID cataracts these past two years. We've become, has the real, it's the real pandemic. The virus is real, I'm not discounting it. But the reaction to the virus is blinding so many by, being, by ignoring early treatment, closing churches, mandating masks, experimental vaccines with the board of fetal tissue mandates, leading to loss of jobs or loss of life from the, this gene therapy. Being forced upon has become, it's because it's the loving thing to do. And the most egregious is to inject the spike protein in children who have no chance, very little chance of dying of COVID. I was flying in from Nebraska a couple days ago and the news said that in Connecticut, they want to give this um, they want to give this to children without, and they don't need parental notification. And our dear future doctors look, it's looking a little grim with mo woke medical schools educating to teach that transgenderism and abortion is just another option and something medical students need to do. And even some so called Catholic medical schools are doing this. The closing of monasteries, suppression of TLM, traditional Latin mass processing Pacamama in St. Peter's. These are just a few things that are happening this past year. And all this brings to me, brings me to what I want, I believe is the most important thing I could share with you all tonight. We have to be in the state of grace to see, to better see as Christ sees. We have to be like Joan of Arc, who when in battle, she made sure her men maintained purity. They had to be, which means being in the state of grace. And these three guys are the key to it. They are persona Christi. Confession and Holy Communion was what she wanted them to have. No girlfriends in case they were killed in battle and that sword went in their chest and they fell to the ground. Joan would feel like her soldiers had gone to our Lord. When she was captured, she, you, know, you know, we know the story, but when she was captured by the British and the canon lawyer, British canon lawyers had her. They were trying to prove that she was either a witch or whatever they were trying to do, that she was proud so that they could come up with a reason to burn her to the stake. And they asked her, Joan, the canon lawyer said, Joan, are you in the state of grace? She knelt down and she said, she, her answer was a prayer. She said, Lord, if I'm in the state of grace, please keep me there. And Lord, if I'm not in the state of grace, please put me there. So we have to first strive within ourselves to be pure and holy before we can help others. It's like being on a plane. The oxygen drops, and the stewardess says what? She says, put the oxygen on yourself first. When I first heard that, I thought, that's kind of selfish. You don't want to take care of everybody else first. But no, it's really um, the most important thing to do. You have to take care, put the oxygen on yourself, and then you can help everybody else because you can breathe. And that's similar to our spiritual life. We have to seek, and also we have to seek holiness with humility. One of my favorite saints, St. Saint Philip Neri, said, Lord, don't leave me for a moment because I can't be trusted. <laughs> so by being in the state of grace, don't, by being in the state of grace, we can all more see, easily see God's will for us as pro-life warriors for the salvation of all souls. If we're not in the state of grace, it's like our lens are smudged. They're dirty. 
And that's where we make a mad dash to confession and ask for absolution from our Lord through Persona Christi. <coughs> so the destruction of human life in the mother's womb is Satan's battleground, is ground zero, Satan's ground zero, in which innocent life is destroyed, which opens the door as a whirlwind to other evils that are rippling, or like a rippling effect of a stone on a very still lake. And with that still lake, that stone ripples out. So what is that rippling? That is transgender ideology, contraception, the destruction of families, fatherless families, euthanasia, the production of so-called vaccines used by innocent children that were aborted, and then they're mandated, leading to loss of jobs. And in my case, the D.C. took my license away because they would not accept my religious exemption. There's, I was just a little tip on the spear of an arrow that if I fell, all those asking for religious exemptions would fall. And Thomas More, I don't know if we have any Thomas More lawyers here, but they took on my case. Chris Ferrara, who's a great Fatima mm -hmm. writer, and I didn't know at the time, but we, um, you know, we were able to fight that. And Laura Ingram and Raymond Aurora helped put this out so, to shame the D.C. government. Because I do free surgery for the poor. We run a pro bono physical therapy clinic. We do a diabetic eye pro bono clinic. We have the abortion pill reversal. Um, and I also had COVID, and I've got mounting antibodies. And regardless of what you hear, I learned at Georgetown Med School that your, your self-immunity far supersedes any vaccine and booster, booster, booster. So the, the, we sued D.C. and we won in three weeks. And thank you to the Thomas More Society for helping me fight back to retain my license. So the overturning of Roe, yeah, thank you. So the overturning of Roe v. Wade has led to outrages which those guided by the evil ones. You know, we've heard about Jane's revenge. They say, if abortion is not safe, neither are you. I mean, it's so evil. The conservatives are being targeted. All these pro-life issues. So please, make it your daily mission to be in the state of grace so you can hear more, to hear Christ more clearly. And prepare yourselves and those near you for our ultimate goal, which is eternity in heaven. <clears throat> As I always say, I'm not only pro-life, I'm pro-eternal life, and I want everyone to be with us. But not everyone is going to go. There is a hell. It's real. But we don't want that. We want them to, to, we want to teach the faith and bring people closer to Christ. So we thank God for Roe v. Wade. It's been overturned. We still have a lot of work to do. But lastly, I feel compelled to, to ask you to pray for our president and others who are in the political office who actively support the destruction of children in the womb. And we have to just say thank you to those politicians. We have one here tonight, Senator from Alabama. Could you stand up? Is he here? Arkansas. We must confess it's Arkansas. I'm not. Oh, Arkansas. <laughs> it starts with a name. Arkansas. That's right. Sorry about that. Mea culpa. <laughs> so, so thank you all. So I just want to. So when we pray, we pray every morning. This is the last little tidbit I'll say, is that we pray every morning the Patriotic Rosary. If you don't know the Patriotic Rosary, it's beautiful. Access it on the internet. But basically, you pray. There's five. You pray for the president. The we pray for the Supreme Court, the the Senate, and the House, the representatives, the governors. And we pray for the county municipal offices. There's 50 states. There's how many Hail Marys, guys, in back there, high school? How many Hail Marys do we pray in a rosary? We pray 50. We pray 53. But there's 50 states, 50 Hail Marys for the decades. So we put, so we place the blood of Jesus over this bless you of Arkansas, Virginia, and every Pennsylvania, and every soul in that state. So every no every morning that's this little chapel in DC uh, is praying for you all. Preston's a witness of it. He prays with us when he comes. So I just want to thank you all for staying awake and um, <laughs> and uh, we'll just pray. We're going to end with one of my favorite prayers, which I think you all will know. 
Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke you.